Hi, this is Alex Howard, and today we'll be mapping fatigue on the 15-minute matrix. Welcome to the 15-Minute Matrix. I'm Andrea Nakayama, functional medicine nutritionist and your host. This is the podcast that brings you bite-sized insights and lessons on the clinical relevance of the functional nutrition matrix, the most important tool in functional medicine and functional nutrition. The matrix is so important not only because it causes us to stop and assess, but also because it reminds us of three very important factors in our care, our recommendations, and our outcomes. Everything is connected, we are all unique, and all things matter. Be sure to head over to this episode's show notes at 15minutematrix.com if you'd like to see today's topic mapped on a downloadable matrix to remind you of these critical aspects of care. Today on the 15 Minute Matrix, I'll be speaking with Alex Howard. Alex Howard is founder and chairman of the Optimum Health Clinic, OHC, one of the world's leading integrative medicine clinics specializing in fatigue. With a team of 20 full-time practitioners supporting thousands of patients in over 50 countries, the OHC team have pioneered working with patients remotely since 2004. Along with founding and leading the OHC practitioner teams for the past 17 years, Alex has led the Therapeutic Coaching Practitioner Program since 2005, training the next generation of psychology practitioners. Since March 2020, Alex has been documenting his therapeutic work with real-life patients via his In Therapy with Alex Howard YouTube series. Alex's latest book, Decode Your Fatigue, a clinically proven 12-step plan to increase your energy, heal your body, and transform your life has just released. And before Alex and I get started, I want to make it known that Alex's previous 15-Minute Matrix podcast episode, that's number 20, Mapping the Sympathetic Nervous System, is our number one recommended podcast listen for all of our Full Body Systems students and graduates. So give a listen to this amazing conversation about fatigue, but be sure to bookmark episode number 120 as it's filled with functional clinical pearls. Alex, I am beyond thrilled to have this time with you and to welcome you back to the 15-Minute Matrix. Andra, it is always a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. I know we always have so much fun together, so much synergy in what we discuss. And I know today we are talking about fatigue, but we're not just talking about staying up late and needing a nap. We're talking about what might be termed chronic fatigue, adrenal or adrenaline fatigue, or chronic low energy Alex, can you help us to understand the difference and what we might be listening for from our clients or patients to signal that they're experiencing one of these more sustained states of fatigue? For sure. I think one of the most important differences is that it is fatigue that doesn't have an obvious cause. And so, you know, as you say, if someone is staying up late, if someone is under ongoing sustained stress at work or in their personal life, whatever it may be. It's a normal human response for over time, the body to become depleted and become fatigued. But that fatigue should respond to the normal things, right? It should respond to rest, to timeouts. The difference with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, fibromyalgia, you know, there's a whole group of conditions that we can somewhat lump together here, is that there isn't that obvious explanation. You know, this has its own problems. It's what in a more standard medical context would be called a medically unexplained illness. 
of course, in our world, there's lots of explanations, and that's some what I'm sure we'll get into today. And I know that it's something you've talked a lot about in the podcast previously. But in that more traditional medical world, it's that there's fatigue, and it's disproportionate to the burdens or the loads that person has experienced, and they don't know why. I love that you talked about that medically unexplained piece, and this is often associated with chronic unresolved issues that it falls outside. And that's likely because there's more than one route, right? As we'll get into, there might be myriad things or there likely are myriad things going on in the body. I'm wondering if we can go over to the left side of the matrix, what I like to think of as the story and consider some of the underlying factors that might be happening there in somebody's history or in their story, even starting with genetics. And Alex, I ask that because I have a genotype that kind of makes me an energizer bunny. Like I can (laughs) keep getting knocked down and I will feel fatigue, but like I can get up fairly easily and have a lot of serotonin and good dopamine production. I keep on going, but that's not the case for everybody. Do we know anything about genes and chronic fatigue? So the research is that there is a moderate genetic impact in what what I sort of classify as fatigue-related conditions. It's certainly not a direct causal relationship. And I think it's one of those great examples of where epigenetics is really the important piece. There's not a the chronic fatigue gene. There's a bunch of different genes that may be involved. But how one lives one's life, the different experiences, emotional, physical loads that gets placed on one's body is, of course, what determines the activation of those genes. And I think as the genetics research evolves and develops in the the coming years, I think we'll get increasing clarity. But one of the things that always makes me a little bit nervous is when you see that, particularly in in the popular press, you see the article, they've discovered the cancer gene or they've discovered that this gene. And I think the danger of that is it's actually really disempowering to people that are affected by these conditions because it's like, oh, well, it's it's caused by my genes. So actually, uh, I can't really do anything about it. The truth is that there are so many, as you alluded to, Andrea, there's so many different factors. And that was, for me, actually, one of the challenges of writing my most recent book that I put off writing this book for years. And the reason was that I know how publishers work. I know how sort of mainstream media works. They want you to come out with the simple, simple yes. answer. <laughs> it's why I haven't published a book yet, because <laughs> <laughs> it's not the simple answer. Sorry. <laughs> right. And it's like, how do you capture and sort of bring together all these different pieces of a jigsaw in a way that's coherent and easy to follow when, you know, the way that you and I work, and I know many of the practitioners that listen to your podcast and follow your work work, is that it's a patient-centered approach. It's responding to the individual differences of each person we're working with. But I think what's also true, and I know this is also a, a big passion in your work, is as much as there are those individual differences, there are maps and there are patterns and they can be enormously helpful. Yes, I love that. And yes, always the epigenetics and the N of one and really seeing what's true for this individual and really getting that full history in place. So bring us a little bit more into the map and what we might be thinking of in terms of triggers and physiological factors that can be impacting fatigue. So I think about it as two different maps. There's the map to decode fatigue, in a sense, to diagnose or figure out the different ingredients and variables that have come together to create the experience of fatigue. There's then a separate map that we need to map the path to recovery. So if we look at that map to decode that we just talked about genetics, certainly there's a genetics piece. There's then, I, as you know, part of my background is particularly working on the psychology side. I'm fortunate enough to work with a team of very experienced functional medicine in, informed and trained nutritional therapists. So that piece is incredibly important in my mind. But I'm also always looking at what are the psycho-emotional elements that are also going on. And there are certain personality patterns. There are certain ways of relating to ourselves, relating to our bodies and our symptoms, and relating to the world that are energy draining that can play a role. We can maybe come back to those in a minute. There are then the loads 
that get placed on our system through our life. And those loads might be environmental loads, like being exposed to toxic molds or things in our environment that have an impact. There are viral loads. Someone might get bitten by a tick and develop Lyme or co-infections. There are then some of the life events that we go through. You know, we look at that from an adverse childhood experiences perspective, but also we experience loads in an adult life. We might go through a divorce. We might go through bereavement. We might go through, you know, a lot of people over the last 20 months of the pandemic have been through enormously stressful experiences. So we're taking genetics. We're adding in our personality patterns, which determine how we respond to the events that happen. And then there's the events. There's the loads. There's the burdens that are placed on our system. And I it's not my metaphor, but I really like the metaphor of it being like loads on a boat. And it's not any one single load that causes the boat to get overwhelmed and sink. It's the cumulative effect of multiple loads together. But I think one of the things that often is also forgotten that when one becomes depleted, suddenly things that wouldn't have been stressful before become more stressful. It's like If stress is defined as having more demand than our supply is able to meet, if our supply of energy starts to diminish, we can have the same demand, the same life we were living before, but actually the more depleted we become, the more stressful it actually becomes. And so we have to understand the genetics, our personality patterns, how we respond to events, and then there's the loads and the events themselves. I love that. I hear you saying it's a matrix. That's what it is. (laughs) That's exactly what it is. Yeah, that load are all the things we might be trying to address while we're in that recovery, mapping to recovery, or, or even decoding that assessment phase. I'm really particularly interested in hearing from you about that psycho emotional piece that you said we'd come back to because I see this even with trauma. And as you alluded to with the genes, Alex, how are we identifying or processing the information we know about ourselves and how do we then work with it in recovery? Does that question make sense? It absolutely does. And and I should say that part of how this map of the different personality patterns came about was in the early days of the Optum Health Clinic, we were doing a lot of work with supporting people on a physiological level, particularly as we got into some of the early work around mitochondrial function. This was back in sort of 2005, 2006. And we were loading people up with some of the raw ingredients to support ATP production. So we were putting people on coenzyme Q10, D-ribose, magnesium, the sort of usual stuff that, that you would use. We were also doing a lot of work supporting adrenal function. So we were using different herbal-based ways of working. So we were doing all that stuff. And we had a pretty good toolkit that would give people more energy. People would come in suffering from the kind of that spectrum of different fatigue-related conditions. And most of the time, it wouldn't necessarily be the whole answer, but they would get more energy. But what we noticed was that we had a really high relapse rate, that people would get more energy, but then after a few weeks or a few months, they would crash. And we became really curious, like, why is it that someone's come in, they're fatigued, they've got more energy, and then they're crashing again? Is it what they're taking stop working? Do they need higher doses of what they're taking? What we realized was that people, so these personality patterns I'll mention in a moment, that they would often go offline because someone didn't have the energy to function. When the energy came back, they would go back into the same personality which had played a role, not necessarily a causal role or the only role, but it had been a factor in them getting fatigued in the first place. So these patterns are, the first one is the helper pattern. This is where we define our self-worth by what we do for other people. So let's say we get home after a long day at work, our body's saying, I'm tired, I need rest. We get a text message from a friend saying, I'm having a really bad day, can you come around and keep me company? Our body says no, we override it because helping and being there for that person is more important than our own needs. That's just one example of a helper pattern. The second is the achiever. This is where we define our self-worth by what we do and what we achieve in the world. Whatever we achieve is never quite enough. We're always pushing and driving ourselves to do more. The third is the anxiety pattern. This is where we have 
an inherent sense that the world is not a safe place, and we try to think our way to a feeling of safety. There's this constant overactivation of our nervous system, which we spoke about in the previous interview that we did for your podcast. The fourth being the controller pattern. This is where we need to always be in control of ourselves and other people to feel safe. The fifth one being the perfectionist. This is where our sense of safety, our sense of lovability is tied to doing things the right way and doing things perfectly. And if you imagine each of these patterns, they are inherently draining and depleting ways of functioning in the world. Some of us might have one or two of them. Others might have all of them in different ways. But if this is our our operating system, this is the way of responding to our own body, this is the way of responding to the world around us, the world becomes an increasingly draining and depleting place to be. So well put, and it really identifies where we're in that behavior in our life and also with our own bodies that we are achieving or we're trying to be perfect or we're trying to control the uncontrollable and how exhausting that becomes. So what is the map to recovery when we identify these patterns of behavior? The path to recovery, again, as we said, there are lots of different pieces, ingredients, but the simple way of putting it is, firstly, there's the state, the state that our nervous system is in. For our body to heal, we have to be in a healing state. And often the experience of suffering from a medically unexplained condition, i.e. the people that we go to for certainty, either tell us that there's nothing wrong with us, which is pretty traumatic when you know there's something wrong with you or right. there's something wrong with you, but there's nothing that can be done about it. And, and I'm going to avoid getting too far onto my soapbox around the kind of arrogance of <laughs> both of those perspectives. <laughs> um, I, had a, I had a good rant about it in the book and I, I toned it down a little bit, but I <laughs> kept most of my feelings in We'll there. have to keep that separate, <laughs> like a two hour YouTube video or something where we can rant about that yeah. arrogance. <laughs> I look forward to that. So the state that we're in is really important. We have to cultivate a healing state and again, we talked about that in, in the previous interview that we did. The next piece is there are different stages to the recovery process. Certain stages, certain interventions can be incredibly helpful, but at other stages, they can be incredibly harmful. And an obvious example of this would be that certainly here in the UK, for a whole bunch of reasons that we, we won't have time to get into now, graded exercise therapy, i.e. the idea that that fatigue is simply a state of disordered thinking and deconditioning in the body, of basically training one to do more activity. But what we would classify as stage one, where someone's in a crash stage, is only going to serve to push them deeper into the crash that they're in. But at the second half of what we classify as stage three in the reintegration stage, actually, it's time to do some reconditioning. And that can be a really helpful way of increasing activity carefully and not doing too much too quickly. So we really have to figure out what stage somebody's at. Another example, but perhaps more relevant to the functional medicine community, is working with doing detoxing protocols. If someone is in a crash stage, often you need to build up their resilience first to then be able for the system to have the capacity to handle the detoxing. This is where often with the more sensitive patients, you see very well-intentioned, you know, great practitioners doing the right intervention at the wrong stage and through no kind of intent to do harm, doing harm. So we have to really understand the stage someone's at. And then the third piece is we have to sequence intervention to meet the stage that somebody's at. And this was one of my particular, I really had to hold myself back on this piece of the book because I have so much to say about this. It's sort of my pet kind of favorite subjects is that mapping. And I know, again, this is an area that you go into in a lot of detail in your own trainings and your work around how do you sequence? How do you know what order to do things in? Because that sequence can literally be the difference between driving someone into relapse and someone getting right on the path to recovery. Mm. 
So well said, Alex. As I said, there's always so much synergy in our work and I love getting to talk to you about it. Is there anything else you wish we all knew about fatigue and that we're doing all wrong? We will certainly link to the book in the show notes so that we can read more. But if there was one or two things where you see you practitioners are doing fatigue all wrong or you patients are doing fatigue healing all wrong, what would those be? You know, I I wouldn't go as far as to say it's a generic thing that everyone's doing wrong, but there's certainly something that I feel strongly about, which is that the body has enormous wisdom. And one of the real, I think, lessons for people on the fatigue healing journey is to learn to listen to their own body But also as practitioners, we can sometimes get blinded and bedazzled by data from lab tests and all of the information we've got and all the clinical picture we've got. Sometimes we can miss the most important information in front of us, which is the real-time lived experience of the patient, of how they're actually responding to things. And I think in the sort of principle of do no harm, sometimes practitioners can be too enthusiastic to drive sensitive patients down protocols that theoretically make sense, but may not necessarily be the thing that's most helpful in this experience. And I can think of so many patients over the years that have atypical responses to interventions, be those medical interventions or indeed, you know, more functional medicine informed interventions. And so, yes, of course, lab results are really important. Protocols are really important. You know, using maps is really important, but not only do I say encourage your patients to listen to their bodies, but as practitioners, we also have to listen to the bodies of our patients. Brilliant, Alex. I love it. Thank you so much. That's a mic drop right there. The message we all need to hear. I appreciate your time and can't wait to read the new book. Andres, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. The 15-Minute Matrix is brought to you by me, Andrea Nakayama, and the Functional Nutrition Alliance. Check out the latest in functional nutrition at functionalnutritionlab.com forward slash blog. The 15-Minute Matrix is produced, mixed, and edited by Rowan Bradley with production support from Natalie Merrill and the team at the Functional Nutrition Alliance. You can find episodes on all kinds of topics with more incredible guests at our podcast website, 15minutematrix.com. And if you'd like to be notified by email each week about our podcast releases, head on over to 15minutematrix.com forward slash notify. Also, please feel free to get in touch with us. We would love to hear your thoughts, your feedback, and who you'd like to hear next on the podcast. You can email us at ask at 15minutematrix.com. 